<laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> So, so Steph, is the message because you are streaming on YouTube or something? I just yes. got the ah, oh, okay. So I just yes. do got it. Okay. Um, it's always a <clears throat> slight delay because you have to activate it twice to stream. Ah. But it is working, and we have thirteen people with us online. Hello. <laughs> Uh, now, we discussed it earlier, uh, everyone watching on YouTube is more than welcome to uh, submit their questions in the chat and I will then bring them into our Zoom meeting. Now, uh, today we have Marco Palombo, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, perfect. Cool. <laughs> uh, who's joining us currently from Italy, but usually he should be in beautiful Cardiff uh, in the UK, where he's currently an associate professor uh, and a... UK Research and Innovation Fellow with plenty of tasks related to MRI, AI, and all the rest of it. Uh, before that, he was at UCL, and his background is actually in physics and biophysics. And today he's going to talk about his latest research on imaging the brain at a different scale than we're used to. Marco, if you want to take it away, the floor is all yours. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction. I will uh, share the screen. Uh, we did the test. Audio should be fine. And you see the correct slides. Correct. Okay. Just want to put the pointer. Then we are get these away. Okay. Should be fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. So I have to apologize a little bit. I have a bit of cold. So my my voice is uh, worse than usual, but uh, hopefully this won't uh, stop us to enjoy uh, one hour uh, talking about microstructure imaging uh, uh, of the brain using, uh, I would say, diffusion MRI, because MRI is a, is a huge technique with many modalities. I will focus mostly on the diffusion-weighted MRI, so one specific modality. And uh, I organized the talk in, uh, in the following way. I will first uh, uh, clarify for us and for the, uh, for, for the remit of this talk, what I mean for microstructure imaging and what is the classical paradigm. And then I will go into uh, a brief overview of what has been done to apply it to white matter. So characterizing white matter microstructure and gray matter. And I'll conclude with uh, a single take home message, uh, which I think is important to highlight is uh, the difference between what we would like to measure and what we can actually estimate with diffusion MRI, which I think is one of the most important take away message I would like to leave you after this talk. Uh, also, I want to apologize uh, early on. Uh, this is not a comprehensive review of all the over 20 years of development in the field. I just uh, cherry picked a few papers and a few works that would fit nicely the story I would like to tell you. So I would like to apologize if uh, I don't mention everybody in the field. Anyway, so microstructure imaging in this uh, context, in the talk context of this talk, what we mean is to try to use the MRI as a microscope. So we would like to uh, assess and estimate tissue features that usually require resolution of micrometers or sub uh, or smaller than the micrometer. And obviously, the MRI, even the most powerful uh, machines uh, that we can uh, uh, we can use nowadays, have an hardware limitation that cannot push the resolution. If we go to human, for example, uh, below one uh, millimeter cube when we do diffusion weighted MRI. And the features we would like to estimate are, for example, the orientation of the cellular projections or the axons, the density of the cell bodies, the sizes, and uh, so on and so forth. So there is an obvious uh, resolution gap that we need uh, to bridge in order to uh, make the MRI uh, similar to a microscope. And uh, there are many ways we can do this, break the nominal re image resolution. Uh, over 20 years ago, it was suggested that one possible way of doing this is to exploit the diffusion of endogenous molecules, for example, water, that 
it's abundant and ubiquitous in the biological tissues, and uh, uh, use this uh, thermal agitation or uh, random motion of water molecules within the tissue as an indirect probe of the tissue microstructure. If we look at the typical displacement, mean square displacement of water molecules within an MRI acquisition, which uh, can last uh, for, uh, uh, for example, one second or a hundred of milliseconds, we will see that water in uh, the brain would travel on a uh, length scale, which is comparable to the macro scale. And hence, it can probe barriers and restrictions induced by the cellular membrane on this length scale. So this is exactly the microscopic lens we would like to use to, to break the uh, nominal resolution limit of the image. Now, here I, I mentioned this equation. There won't be many equations in the talk, but this is one of, the, of those I really would like to, to keep because it's a, the centerpiece of microstructure imaging. So here what we see is that the water molecule displacement can be characterized by this function G which is the diffusion propagator. And tell me what is the probability that a molecule in position R moves to uh, position R prime in a given time T. And it's this uh, function, it's this probability density function that we probe with diffusion weighted MRI. In fact, the signal we measure is just the Fourier transform of this probability density function. And uh, uh, the problem is that we don't access this directly. Uh, if we would like to know how this probability density function is done, we will need to solve the diffusion equation uh, for our system, which means assigning a specific boundary condition and a specific initial condition. Now, the problem is when the boundary is simple, we can solve this analytically, and so we can provide uh, an analytical simple relationship between the observed signal and the underlying structure. But if the uh, boundary, the cellular boundary is very complex, then resolving analytically this uh, equation is practically impossible. Now, let's just not focus on this aspect for the moment. Let's just focus how can we probe this function. Even if we don't know it, we can still use uh, radio frequency pulses combined with pulses of gradient, uh, magnetic field gradients to probe the direction of this function. So if it is an isotropic or an isotropic, and we can also play with the diffusion time, which means we can let molecules diffuse longer or, 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 or for less time. So if molecules diffuse for less time, it means I can, I'm probing shorter distances, like one micron. If I let uh, the diffusion time go longer, then I can probe longer or larger structure up to 50 micron. So it's important to understand that when we use a diffusion weighted sequence in diffusion MRI, we have this power in our hands. We can tune the signal to be sensitive to different features of this diffusion propagator. Even if we don't know the exact shape of it, even if we don't know the exact nature of it. Now, as I said before, if we assume very, very simple geometry such as spheres, or uh, uh, like molecules bouncing between two planes, then we can solve the diffusion equation and we can have uh, an exact analytical expression for this probability density function. In the case of uh, diffusion orthogonal to two parallel planes is, uh, is given by this uh, expression, which can look ugly to some of us, but it's handy, meaning that we can easily calculate the, a few terms of this series expansion, and they are enough to fully characterize the signal. And same can be said for the sphere. Now, the problem is that if we look at the tissue, we don't have spheres and planes, we have complex structures. Some tissue types, such as gray matter here on the right, are extremely complex if we look at the shape of the membrane. Some others, like white matter, is arguably a little bit easier to, uh, let's say, to characterize. Here you see an example of all axons oriented all uh, coherently in one way. So the question in microstructure imaging 
with diffusion MRI is how can we go from what we measure this signal to the feature of the tissue that originated that signal. And to do that, we need to uh, probe the diffusion propagator. As I said, because the shapes involved are not simple, we have to make them simple. And to do this, we use uh, classically, what has been done is to, is to use biophysical model. So uh, what, what exactly I mean for biophysical modeling in this context? So usually we acquire diffusion weighted uh, MR images. This is an example of changing the gradient strength and the direction. So you see that the contrast in the image changes depending on the way the uh, boundaries of the cell arrangements are hindering the diffusion of water molecules. If we focus on one voxel and we look at a normalized signal decay, we will see the uh, normalized signal, we will see that the signal decays in intensity as a function of, for example, the gradient strength we apply, the diffusion weight. And so in each voxel, we get a signal decay that once it's normalized, go from one to a certain value, either zero or, or non-zero value. Biophysical modeling in this context means assuming a simpler uh, picture for the underlying tissue that we can uh, handle analytically and uh, for which we can uh, compute exactly what is the uh, diffusion propagation. So let's assume we want to focus on one matter. We know that the actual microstructure is complex, made of many axons of irregular shape. But we assume as a simplified model that the only feature we care about is the direct main direction of the axon and the fact that water it's an all-low structure and so water molecule can diffuse inside it. And so we assume that we model the axons as cylinders, hollow cylinders, for which we know the expression of the diffusion signal. Sorry, we know the expression of the propagator. We solve the diffusion equation. We take the Fourier transform. We get what is the equivalent diffusion signal of it. We need to, to model the tissue, not the single axon, not only the single axon. And so we assume that the tissue is a weighted, uh, volume weighted sum of, of the contribution from all these axons. And so the signal, in this case, is the signal uh, measured orthogonally to the axonal uh, uh, axis, will be given by the uh, volume weighted uh, signal of all the axons, each of them with a different radius, weighted by the distribution of this possible radii. We can then fit this model to the data, and we can get what is the average uh, cylindrical radius and what is the average density or volume fraction of cylinder in our voxel? Now, this is what biophysical modeling does. Simplifies the microstructure of the tissue of interest and then allows you via uh, a, a elegant analytical formalism to estimate the model parameter in each voxel. However, these are model parameters and we do this extra uh, uh, logic jump saying that the cylindrical radius that we estimate in each voxel is a good proxy of the axonal radius. The cylindrical density or volume fraction is a good proxy of the axonal density or volume fraction, and so on and so forth. So validating this arrow, this relationship between the estimated model parameter and the actual tissue feature is, a, is a, an open uh, and wild research field in, uh, in, in our field. So. Uh, uh, it's something I encourage you to have a look at, but I won't have time to uh, to explore it here. Here, I would rather focus on uh, uh, the fact that models, we said, are sketches of reality, capturing the most meaningful features. But not all the tissue types or not all the, yeah, the biological tissues are easy. And not always is easy to find what are these most meaningful features. This is particularly true for gray matter. So in what uh, uh, I would like to do now is show you how people have identified historically in our field the relevant features for white matter and gray matter and give you a, a, a brief overview of the different approaches and uh, what they uh, achieved. So uh, be before jumping into the models, we need to understand how the brain uh, tissue 
uh, looks like uh, from the microscopic scale. And so here uh, uh, I went through the literature and I tried to summarize a little bit uh, the composition of the brain tissue. So when we talk about the human brain, we have uh, uh, tens of billions of cells. And uh, uh, these cells uh, are not only neurons, but also glia and other support cells. So if we look at glia versus neurons, uh, they are not in equal uh, ratio. So there are more, there is more glia than neurons. And in particular, uh, for uh, uh, the adult uh, male brain, we have uh, 1.4 times more glial cells uh, for each neuron. We have 1.4 glial cells for each neuron. And if we look at the composition of these glial cells, in number, in cell count, that we have more oligodendrocytes than astrocytes and microglia. But in terms of volume, the astrocytes occupy more volume. So we have more volume fraction in the brain occupied by the astrocytes, followed by oligodendrocytes. And microglia is a very, very small uh, glial cell, which uh, is not that abundant in healthy condition. This is healthy condition. If we look at the gray matter, we, we see that the gray matter is mostly comprised of intracellular space. Extracellular is about 20% and vasculature is maximum 5%. What is interesting is that if we look at the intracellular space, this is mostly occupied, the volume fraction of, by volume is mostly occupied by cellular projections. So uh, dendrites or uh, glial cell processes and so on. And 20% by soma, the cell body. Again, cell body of all the cell types. So in general, if we look at gray matter composition, we could claim that it's mostly intracellular and the intracellular space have mostly two features of importance, cell projection and cell body. If we look at the white matter, the white matter don't, uh, doesn't have a lot, uh, many cell bodies. Those uh, that we find in the white matter are mostly from the glial uh, cells. Uh, however, the intraglia uh, volume fraction is only 12%. The vast majority is intraaxonal and uh, with the axons being mostly myelinated. So uh, here you see a 34% in Y matter occupied by myelin. Bear in mind that from diffusion MRI, we do not see this 34% because the echo time is usually much longer than the T2 relaxation time of the intramyelin water. And so we lose completely the sensitivity to detect this 34% of uh, volume fraction occupied by myelin. And we are mostly sensitive to the extracellular, some glia, and the intraaxonal uh, volume fraction. If we look at the gray matter intracellular space, Again, we have mostly cell body, and then we have dendrites and axons. Axons are mostly unmyelinated in the gray matter, and only 5% are myelinated. But interestingly, uh, recently it has been shown that even those, those uh, uh, that 5% of myelinated axons is not even uh, uniformly myelinated along uh, the full length of the axon. Uh, they are myelinated in batches, and the length of this batch depends on the cell type of the neuron type and the, and the function of these neuronal cells, which I found extremely interesting. If we look at the uh, cell bodies, again, the number of cell bodies uh, is mostly from neurons and only 5% is from gli glial cells. But this doesn't stay constant across the lifespan, not even during development. Here you see these are data from uh, uh, the rat somatosensory cortex at 14 days after birth. And in this recent, in this paper uh, uh, from Bandera et al, they showed that if you follow the ratio between uh, neurons and non-neurons, you will see that in some areas of the brain, after a certain developmental point, this ratio changes and you get more non-neuronal cells than neuronal cells. Most of these are glial cells. If you look at the whole brain, uh, it remains pretty much constant with neurons being more than non-neurons with 1.4 uh, ratio, but some areas invert with development. 
and also aging. So uh, when it comes to modeling, knowing if it is only soma or uh, cell projection that occupy the space is not enough. We need to have more information if we want to develop proper models of, uh, for instance, the gray matter. And uh, this information is out there, but it wasn't uh, tailored for microstructure imaging with diffusion MRI. So what we did a couple of years ago was to uh, download the real reconstruction from over 3,000 uh, cells uh, from open access database, such as Neuromorpho and the Allen uh, uh, Atlas. Uh, from eight cell types, including glia and neurons, from three species. And we dissected these cells, going uh, to measure to, to measure the fine uh, features of it. So here, this is a table summarizing what we found. I don't expect you to get a lot out of this table because it's too complex. I invite you to see uh, the work which you can find online on uh, 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 the PDF is online. What I want to point out here is that we estimated uh, uh, over 12 features, which are of level relevance for biophysical modeling with diffusion MRI. And uh, we summarized it uh, for cell type and species. Here I give you just the uh, uh, overall uh, uh, average values between neurons and glia. So, uh, we found out that in general, on average, the cells in the brain are very big, uh, 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 occupy very big spatial domains. So on average, we are talking about uh, a few hundreds of microns. And the cell body of the cell, on average, occupy 30% of the whole body. And they are very branched structure with branch order nine, meaning you have uh, a process that uh, on average branch before case at least nine times. And also you have several projections on average six radiating from the solar. Some cells have more, some cells have less. You'll find this specific number in the table. But here the point I want to make is that uh, the cell domain is very big, hundreds of microns. The cell body occupies an important volume fraction of it. Is it uh, uh, possible to model the cell body as a closed surface? Or, uh, or uh, because you have uh, a lot of projection radiating, we need to account for leakage of molecule, where it turns out that actually, if you look at the fraction, if you look at the percentage of cell body surface open to projection, to cellular projection, is on average only 18%. So it means it's very unlikely that the molecule which is inside the soma of a glial cell or a neuron in the diffusion time we measure escape from one of these holes that you can see here and go in the projection. And the size of the soma is quite big. On average, the radius is seven microns. So we are talking about diameters of 15 micron or above. And finally, if we look at the projections, these are comprised of branches, so for instance, this bit here, which are on average 50 micron, so quite long, but they are very thin. So only 1.5 micron on average is the, is the radius of this projection. Something which is very important is that the long the projection, the sides change quite a lot. So the, co the coefficient of variation uh, of the caliber of the fiber is one micron which is a lot when the fiber itself is 1.5 micro. So you have this beading or irregularly varying size of the, axon, of, the, of the projection. And this is true for axons and for dendrites and for glial uh, cellular projection. And it's very tortuous. So the tortuosity is 1.3, meaning that the diffusion along the projections is slowed down quite a lot. So, now that we have all of these numbers, we can start uh, understanding how to model properly white matter and gray matter. Because we need to keep in mind that what we are very sensitive to using diffusion MRI is whatever characteristic length is comparable to the diffusion length of water molecules during our acquisition. And here is that diffusion time we can tune which on average for clinical scans is around 20 micron. 
and the diffusion encoding, which is the gradient strength and direction, but mostly the gradient strength, uh, which for a clinical scanner uh, brings us to at best five bytes. So these are the, the features that we would like to measure ideally with our MRI microscope, but this is our sensitivity. And so now we have to also consider that in each voxel, we don't have one number for one cell. We have a, we have a set of cells, which means we have a distributions of features. Some of these distributions overlap across cell types and also uh, yes, and also within the same cell type across different cell uh, um, cell type between different neurons or different glial cells. So, for instance, the branch length uh, you see here how between microglia and and neurons or stellate they overlap the distribution. So it means even if we have the sensitivity, we most likely won't be able to discriminate what comes from microglia, what comes from a neuron. But if we look at the cell body, the distribution start arranging themselves a little bit more. And we start some differences, perhaps significant, start arising. For instance, the microglia has very small cell bodies and oligodendrocytes have quite bigger cell bodies. And that von Economo has huge cell bodies. So you can imagine that if you can measure cell bodies size, you can start thinking of applying some uh, discrimination between cell types, assuming uh, that this holds also in pathology. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll go uh, quicker now that we are on the same page. We know more or less the kind of features we want to measure. And we know uh, the, the biophysical modeling game. If the feature size uh, characteristic length scale is comparable with our sensitivity length scale, then we can measure it. So everybody start uh, focusing uh, in, in microstructure imaging with white matter because it was uh, the most reasonable uh, uh, thing to do. We saw that both gray matter and white matter are mostly characterized by fibers. And in white matter, these fibers are even more dominant than in gray matter. And they are uh, perhaps more ar arranged uh, with, uh, with more order and packed more densely. And so uh, for white matter modeling, really the first question was how do we model a cell fiber or an axon that is of a shape like the one I showed here? Well, the first thing to do was let's assume we are in perfect condition. So preclinical studies where we can use very strong gradients and let's have a look at what we talked about, the features. Uh, if we look at the curvature of the feature uh, of the cell uh, projection or the accents, is on average 55 micro, which means if we don't use extremely long diffusion times, we are completely not sensitive to it, which is a good news. We can use a straight model. Is the branching, the fact that uh, some axons might branch or the dendrites branch uh, negligible, yes, again, if we don't use very long diffusion time, which we usually don't use because of relaxation, uh, loss of signal due to relaxation times, then we can neglect also the branching. Can we measure the size then of this fiber? I said it's very small on average 1.5 micro. Well, if we are a very strong radiance, as is, was shown uh, analytically, analytically by Marcus Nielsen, yes, we can measure uh, we, we, we can have sensitivity to this landscape. However, we need to be careful. If we assume a simple model of straight cylinder, then uh, ondulation and beading, which we can see here, the beading is this variation of the radius along the fiber, can actually bias our estimation of the axon uh, of the fiber diameter. And uh, this is particularly important to keep in mind if we apply any biophysical model to, from healthy to pathological conditions where perhaps undulation or beading can change, but the actual caliber won't change. Well, if we neglect these two contribution, then we get a biased estimates and we wrongly interpret our measure. 
So uh, historically, this was uh, proposed, the cylindrical model to characterize the cell fibers in both white matter and gray matter was proposed by Sune Jespersen in the early 2000s uh, with a two compartment model where uh, the intrafiber space was characterized as a cylindrical compartment. Basically the model I show you here, infinitely long straight cylinder with a given radius and a given diffusivity inside. And the extra axonal space was considered isotropic. Uh, this model was applied ex vivo on rat brain. And this is the uh, nu is the cylindrical volume fraction, which was then uh, validated using the myelin staining. And so here you see how there is a very nice strong correlation between the estimated fiber density and the uh, myelin stain. Not only the fiber density was estimated, it was also estimated the, dis the orientation distribution of these cylinders. And here you can see a validation of this orientation distribution from diffusion MRI on the right and the one obtained from the histology. Again, here we are showing, th these are really nice, beautiful example of how to turn the MRI into a microscope. We are looking at the same thing by using a much higher resolution and potentially this could be used in deep. And in fact, that's what follow-up works tried hard to make, to make the transition from ex vivo tissue where uh, not only single axon diameter was estimated, but a full distribution of axonal diameter within each voxel was compared with uh, uh, the estimations from uh, microscopy in two nerve tissues. Um, and then uh, this is the work by Asaf in early 2000 with the model called Excalibur. And then this was translated into in vivo humans later on by Daniel Alexander in 2010 with the work uh, called Activax, where now in vivo in humans, we can uh, uh, provide estimates of axonal diameter and density uh, in very well aligned uh, re regions where the axons are very well aligned, for example, the corpus callosum. However, when then uh, uh, in, in, uh, in this work, they compared the estimated axon diameter with histology, they realized that, that their estimations were substantially off like they were uh, four times higher than the expected values of the axon diameter in the corpus callosum from histology. The good news was that the trend across the corpus callosum of small, big, small axons going from the one region, I think this is from genu to splenium, was actually uh, captured by the model. Uh, the actual value of the axon was off but the trend of small, big, small axons was captured in both human and models. Uh, in uh, one year later, uh, Gary Zhang proposed uh, as a correction factor to the model, the fact that axons, even in the corpus callosum, they are not perfectly aligned. There is a little bit of uh, dispersion. Uh, and if you look at the sketch down here, you understand that if you have uh, some dispersion and you assume a perfectly a parallel uh, cylinder in your model, you might overestimate the axonal diameter. And in fact, uh, uh, once accounting for dispersion in this model, you will see that in red is the estimations with the new model. So they are smaller than in blue, the, the fully aligned axons, but still quite off from histology. So this, this was a step forward in modeling, but didn't fix completely the problem. Now, many years later, uh, we understood what was uh, the essential problem. The essential problem is the sensitivity of the smallest axons we can get. So uh, Marcus Nielsen in this work proved that, that uh, to have the sensitivity to small axons, so to axons of two micrometers of diameter, we need to have all extremely strong gradients and uh, we have to have both extremely strong gradients, for example, and very, very, very good SNR. So if you are in, only if you are in these two conditions, then you can push down those estimates and go get, and get much closer to the stoppage. And this is what uh, in very recent years in 2020, 
uh, Yelleverad and Susi One Group have been uh, have been uh, demonstrating uh, using a connectome uh, Siemens connectome scanner that can offer for human in vivo uh, extremely strong uh, gradients. Uh, here, the point I want to make is if you want to map axon diameter, you need to have strong gradients, but also you need to have a good SNR. So uh, pushing uh, with the power is not uh, the only solution. Otherwise, you're going to measure just noise. Anyway, now we understand that, that uh, axon diameter, why there was this offset. In, uh, in their art paper, for example, they show nicely how using strong gradients, you go you go down much, much closer. You don't reach the two micrometer because the problem is the, the blue line you see here is the resolution you would get with the connectome. So even with the connectome, you still lose the very small diameters. So at best, we get down to three micron. So we are still a little bit off, but we know exactly why. So when uh, uh, what happens if you have access to a scanner which is clinical? So not preclinical, or if you don't have a, a connectome. So this means that your gradient strength is limited, is not that strong. And also typically you work with fat gradients. So 20 milliseconds gradient duration and 60 milliseconds separation. In these conditions, the model simplifies further because you lose completely the sensitivity to the, to the, to the accents, basically. And so what uh, the field has done in this experimental condition is to consider cell fibers as stick, infinitely long sticks with a given uh, diffusivity inside. And uh, one of the first models proposing this stick um, uh, approximation is the so-called NODI for neuroid orientation, distribution, and density imaging, which assumes that your voxel is is comprised mostly by intraneurite and extraneurite compartment, so water inside the neurite and, extra, uh, and outside the neurites, plus the free water, so accounting for potential partial volume with uh, CSF, for example. And using this model, it's possible to estimate uh, this quant these markers you can see here. The free water fraction, which is the fraction of partial volume with CSF, if you like, the neurite density index, which is the volume fraction of intraneurite space, and the orientation distribution index, which is an index going from zero to one. One means your fibers, both uh, across the brain, are completely isotropically distributed, or uh, uh, zero, they are completely aligned in one direction. As you can see here, zero means very aligned, one means very distributed. And in fact, you see how nice white gray matter contrast you see in these maps. Now, what you can do, even if you don't have strong gradients or, or extremely strong gradients, is you can push your B value higher than, than three. So not the works for B value up to three. So it's a model which relies on some assumption that breaks if you go to higher B values. But if you go to higher B value and the stick like model is valid, then it uh, was proposed recently that you should see this peculiar uh, uh, scaling with a B value. The signal should scale, a normalized signal should scale as one over square root of B. And this was uh, validated in the human across age and across gender, where you can see if you lie in the, in the range of very strong B values, uh, above 3,000 uh, seconds per millimeter square, then you see how the signal scale linearly as a function of one over square root of B. And this uh, stick model is at the basis of all the uh, microstructural imaging in white matter uh, that I did on, don't have time to cover. And so I point you to one of the most recent review by Daniel Alexander that will explain uh, nicely how much has been done with this thick approximation and all the follow-up models. What I would like to discuss with you is, uh, does this thick model holds for gray matter always, or uh, uh, do we have a problem for gray matter we need to change our models? Well, uh, the first uh, observation was uh, provided by Emily McKinnon in 2017, 
which showed that if you focus on the gray matter, so here on the top, you see the white matter, everything is linear in B, in one over square root of B, so it's fine. But then if you look at the bottom one, you have a deviation from this linear trend. And this deviation means that this power law, uh, this, the, this power law as one over square root of B is not supported by the data in gray matter. If you like, you can see here alpha equal to 0 0.5 would means this is true and lower or bigger means this is not true. So white matter is always pretty much true across data set and subjects. Gray matter is always pretty much not true. So the question was why this is not working? What are we missing in our model? And so two options, as I said before, if you look at the tissue composition of the brain, what are the other two major difference between gray matter and white matter? One is the presence of cell bodies or soma, and the other one is myelinated neurites. They are very small, uh, sorry, they are very low in volume fraction, the myelinated neurites or myelinated uh, axons, and also when they are myelinated in batches. So there could be some neglected exchange between the neurite and the extracellular space. If there is less myelin, this exchange is much more likely. So initially, uh, we targeted the contribution of SOMA. We proposed in uh, 2020 the so-called SENDI model, where we included the SOMA as a dedicated compartment. Again, we the reality is the SOMA is not a sphere and is not, and it is also connected. But under some experimental condition that we discussed in the paper, we can uh, we showed that we can approximate very very nicely the the diffusion inside the soma as a diffusion completely restricted in a sphere of equivalent equivalent volume. And uh, and, and so that's what Sandy does. This uh, disentangle the contribution to the overall signal coming from the cell body of the cells from that coming from the cell projections. Uh, this was further validated later on by Olens and et al. and provides you with maps that are uh, a proxy of cell body volume fraction and uh, uh, new ripe volume fraction. And here you can see a qualitative comparison between histone staining uh, from histology and myelin staining. Uh, uh, a, a few works following uh, the Sandy paper replicated the kind of contrast in the cortex, where you can see how cell body density in the average cortical surface follows the Bronman uh, SAT architectural parcellation uh, with low, high, low profile of the cell body density. Uh, more direct validation was provided uh, uh, more recently by Andrada Janusz from Shemesh Lab, where they showed that the, the, the signal fraction from the sphere in the Sandy model correlates strongly with the cell density from the Allen brain atlas uh, in, uh, in mice. And then uh, more direct validation is ongoing with Noam Shemesh Lab, where we are trying to correlate almost one to one the uh, profile of uh, cell body density across the cortical layers in the in the mouse barrel cortex and the DAPI staining. So here, as you, as you can see, we are in a similar situation like the axon diameter uh, in uh, 20, uh, ten, uh, yeah, 20 years ago. Basically, we get the, the right low, high, low, high. So we get the right uh, trend of the soma density, but we don't get the, the perfect match between uh, the actual volume fraction occupied by the soma and what we estimate with Sandy. And so this gap can be a problem of experimental design, can be a problem of relaxation effects, or can be a problem of model assumptions. What also we can see is that if we segment the cell bodies in the cortex and we try to estimate their average size, we actually uh, get it, like we estimate with Sandy 13 micron and histologically is 12. However, if you look at the distribution, we are quite off. This is the distribution all over this cortical area for the same mouse. This is from histology and this is from Sandy. 
Now, it seems that this distribution is very narrow, much narrower than this, and is peaked at higher values than this one. Again, this can be explained by the fact that we, with MRI, we measure a volume weighted sum of contribution. And so effectively, we are weighting much more the tail of the distribution, and we are much less sensitive to the smaller uh, sizes. So Sandy has been uh, translated to clinical scanners, so from preclinical and connectom. And this is a nice example from a paper from Simula Schiavi last year, where uh, uh, they applied it to MS in MS lesions. And what they found, which was quite interesting, is that if you look at these two lesions, one of them seems to have a rim of higher soma density, and the other one doesn't. And so this one, is most likely chronic active where you have accumulation of microglia and the reactive astrocytes, while this one is more likely an old lesion where uh, the extracellular matrix is completely disrupted and uh, uh, there is no chronic, uh, uh, there is not uh, active microglia at the moment. Um, same, uh, same story applied to more uh, uh, MS patients was published uh, uh, by Monica Margoni and her group in Milan, uh, where they demonstrated that indeed uh, the, the Sandy seems to be uh, able to characterize the pathophysiology of, uh, of MS a little bit better than uh, uh, other uh, MRI techniques. Uh, and now I will conclude uh, uh, touching upon the last part of uh, the modeling that we might have omitted, which is the exchange. So uh, the, the, the idea that exchanging gray matter could be non-negligible was proposed uh, initially by Yelverart in 2018, where uh, uh, they proposed, uh, uh, based on the breaking of the power law assumption, this one over square root of B, they proposed a correction factor which relies on exchange rate uh, uh, obtained uh, from the asymptotic uh, uh, behavior uh, from the asymptotic behavior of the Carger model, and they provided maps uh, on the cortical surface of these exchange times, which were estimated between ten and thirty milliseconds. Now, the problem with this approach, which in fact in two thousand eighteen was only an abstract, is that uh, uh, it seemed to be uh, not very robust to fitting and the estimations seem to be not very reliable. Later on, uh, uh, together with uh, Ileana Jalesco, who uh, spearheaded uh, this uh, research, we tried uh, to account for the full target model, not just the asymptotic behavior of it. And we proposed in this paper from NeuroImage 2022, uh, a modified Kargel model with exchange between new rights in the extracellular space. And we call this model next in new right exchange image. At the same time, on the same journal, uh, uh, another group uh, from Sune Jespersen and Hollens and Jonas, they had exactly the same idea. They proposed uh, exactly the same uh, uh, biophysical model, but they called it SMEX, Standard Model with Exchange. Anyway, the two models are uh, equivalent and they both rely on the, on the picture that uh, we can assume gray matter as uh, intraneurite and extraneurite space, but the intraneurite and the extraneurite space now can exchange molecules, water molecules, at a rate, R, which is uh, related to uh, the membrane permeability, if we like. Uh, um, now, validating these exchange estimates was very challenging, and so the only thing we could do in the original paper was to just uh, uh, focus on the meaning, meaningful feature, and so show that the new right density, for example, that we got was uh, correlated very strongly with the neurofilament density and uh, uh, more, more than anything else. Now, in uh, literally a uh, couple of months ago, one month ago, we published the extension, the translation of this model NEXI to uh, the human brain in vivo using the connectome scanner in Cardiff. And here you can see the exchange time uh, in the human brain. And what we found is that in the cortical gray matter, on average, we found an exchange time of 40 milliseconds. So matching what the original work from Yelle Berard was estimating and suggesting that yes, 
the exchange might not be, no, might, is not negligible in the gray matter if you work at clinical diffusion times, but it's not uh, uh, neither ultra fast nor ultra slow. It's around 30, 40 milliseconds. These are our uh, estimates. Uh, one thing that uh, Olens and, and Sune Jespersen showed in their paper is that, uh, however, if you look at the fixed diffusion time, how well Nexios Max predicted the observed signal, you will realize that uh, high B, both the models fail to predict the signal. And the reason why they, they think is that is because it's missing the cell body. When they put back in the model, the cell body, then the model and the data perfectly match. And so uh, uh, for gray matter, the state of the art of the microstructural imaging field is that there are evidence that the exchange between neurites and extra neurite space is not negligible. And there are evidence that the cell body presence is not negligible. And so if you would like a model which has the equivalent parsimony of the white matter model, which is a stick like or cylindrical like structure, then we have to use a model where you have both SOMA and exchange. However, this model is extremely challenging to fit because it has many parameters and requires such a large amount of data that translation to clinical settings is at the moment prohibited. And so we need to work a lot on this. And this is where the field is focusing now the effort is how to get a best estimate of restriction and exchange in a useful time frame for clinical translation. There are some very recent uh, efforts in this direction, for example, from uh, Ted Dikai and Peter Busser group or from Marcus Nielsen group. And uh, I encourage you to have a look at them if you're interested in this topic. For now, I would like to just conclude here with uh, uh, a few uh, take home messages. So as we discussed, what we would like to measure is in white matter, for example, axonal radius. But we need to keep in mind that we cannot access the mean radius. We have a distributions of radii in our voxel. Our MRI is sensitive mostly to the big ones. So we are actually sensitive to the higher order moments of the distribution. And this is exactly what you are estimating when you estimate axon diameter with, uh, with, uh, with diffusion MRI. On top of this, keep in mind that the variation of the radius due to beading or undulation will bias your estimate. And this needs to be kept into uh, account when, uh, when applying these techniques to specifically to pathology. Uh, we would like to measure new right volume fraction. We actually measure a relaxation weighted signal fraction. And so keep in mind that T1, T2, and T2 star are all affecting your estimate of new right volume fraction. And in particular, you, you cannot compare your new right volume fraction estimation uh, at one echo time with somebody else who estimated it at another echo time. There are works that try to, to combine relaxation and diffusion measurements to remove this weighting and get unweighted volume fraction. But generally, uh, keep in mind that unless you use those techniques, your volume fraction is a relaxation weighted one. Same story holds for the SOMA radius. It's, you're not accessing the mean, you're accessing the higher order moments of the distribution. You're not accessing the volume fraction, but a relaxation weighted signal fraction. And finally, I show you there is interest in this ex exchange model. Keep in mind that, that you would like to have uh, a measure of membrane permeability. However, by the nature of uh, our acquisition at the moment, we are not able to distinguish permeative exchange, so meaning across a membrane, from diffusion mediated exchange. And we have an abstract at this year ISMRM where we show uh, nicely how this is, in our opinion, a problem. So if you are interested, we can discuss about this even at ISMRM if you're joined. For now, I would like to thank you all very much for the time you dedicated to listen to me. Or would like to thank all the founders and the beautiful micro team at Kubrick. And I'm very happy to answer questions.
Thank you very much, Marco. That was great. Uh, there was actually various questions going on in the chat while you were talking. So I just want to open up the floor and see if these questions have now been addressed or if you want to confirm or query. Yeah, I guess I can confirm. So I was I had a question <laughs> um, about that basic equation you showed at the beginning. So you were taking the Fourier transform of the diffusion. So I, I just I was just wondering if it's like uh, were you trying to look? It's probably a basic thing with like um, like diffusion weighted imaging, but it's 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 it, um, is it like a Q space transformation? Are you looking for the uh, like the spatial frequency distribution of the uh, yeah, yeah, there are diffusion uh, in a voxel at a certain time is um. Yes, exactly. So okay. what we are doing is pretty much that. What you could do is to actually do the inverse Fourier transform, right? And so you can imagine if you sample densely the Q space, mm -hmm. then you can mm -hmm. just reverse it. Mm -hmm. And there is a large literature about this. And it does work in some uh, to some extent. It's just extremely demanding uh, on the acquisition side. You really need to densely sample the Q space. And also, I have to, to say there are a lot of caveats a lot around the debt equation. I, I kept it simple just to help you have uh, a conceptual link between the microstructure and the signal. But that equation holds if you have very narrow pulses. It The diffusion propagator is not the single molecule diffusion propagator. It's the ensemble average diffusion propagator. So we could, we could uh, th there are several caveats, but... Pretty much, mm -hmm. yes, you are correct. You are doing uh, a Q-space sampling. And then uh, uh, the reason why we don't do the inversion directly is because the inversion is ill-posed and often it requires so much data. It mm -hmm. would be um, impractical. But there, there is a large literature in the past, like Felix Berli Group did a lot of these. Jan Ivasov did a lot of these. Noam mm -hmm. Shemesh did a lot of these. You, you will mm -hmm. find a lot of interesting work about it. Okay, yeah, thank you. And um, thank you for the very interesting talk. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, any any more hands going up? Uh, in the meantime, I guess also want to confirm. So there is this big push towards high field, ultra high field, better resolution scanning. But in order to use the MRI as a microscope, what you need to push are the gradients rather than the field strength, right? Yes, the yes, exactly. Basically, the the the, the idea here is, uh, you know, the, what field would you need to in vivo probe a few micron of resolution on directly on the image? So I, I assume is at the moment with the current technology impossible. So what you can do instead is try to use endogenous probes uh, as a indirect way to access those length scales. And that's what uh, what we do. The sensitivity to which length scale you are sensitive, it comes from uh, the diffusion time. So if you, if you use oscillating gradients, you can squeeze the diffusion time to a few milliseconds and you can probe sub micrometers. You can probe 0 0.5 micron, one micron. So organelle, cellular organelle level. If you let the diffusion time go to one or two seconds, you can probe hundreds of microns. And so, but the diffusion time is only part of the of the sensitivity uh, filter we can use. You use the gradient strength as an additional uh, uh, sensitivity filter, if you like. So the stronger the gradient, the smaller the structure you can resolve. The weaker the gradient, the larger is the structure you can resolve. And so you usually play with these two parameters when you when you do diffusion MRI. Now the B value combines the two together. So it's the, the, the gradient strength times the diffusion time. And so makes the reasoning in terms of B value is not the best thing to do when you want to link the microstructure. You need to reason in terms of Q vector, gradient strength, and diffusion time separately. Thank you. 
Uh, there's also a question that was handed to me by Valentina, and I think you kind of answered it at the very end of your talk. But just to make sure, uh, do you think or is there any evidence that by adding the variability of microstructures to models predicting behavioral outcome after brain damage would increase the model accuracy or actually would we reach a ceiling effect when microstructure modifications are as informative as routine scans derived measures from when predicting complex clinical behavior? Yes, I, I think it's rather the second. You would, uh, I would, uh, so my my feeling is I would avoid to overcomplexify your models. I would try to find the experimental setup where only a few features are the relevant one. And then uh, it contributes uh, significantly to the measured signal. And so you can uh, probe those features with high accuracy. And then uh, you obviously you need to have an hypothesis of what behavior you want to assess. So let's assume your hypothesis is that a specific connection between two gray, gray matter regions have thicker axons and mm -hmm. another one has smaller axons. So here you want to probe the axon diameter for the conduction velocity, for example. And so at that point, you should set your experiment in such a way that you are most sensitive to the axon diameter and you are insensitive to the beading and the axonal variation and so on. It is doable, I think, and the field is moving in that direction, but just require expertise and thorough thinking. But uh, I, I would go that direction. I wouldn't go including a, a lot of variances in each model parameter. That would just explode the inference and make anything, uh, everything very imprecise and uh, ill-posed. Great, I'll pass it on to her. There's two more questions waiting for you. Anna, I think you were first. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, that was very interesting and way more deeper than uh, than during the brain yeah. hack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have a question regarding uh, your um, one of your first slides where you compare the different species and the different cells and different species. So first of all, I wanted to ask, uh, how do different uh, brain sizes influence your results? Because those species have, uh, well, really different brain sizes. And I can imagine that that has an effect on the resolution at the end, what you get out of it, even if on a microstructural level. And the second question is, what is, uh, in regard, again, to that kind of comparison, the interspecies comparison, what is the most interesting or surprising thing that you have found there? So, yeah, these are, uh, um, so I, I think you refer to the table, right? Where I said I dissected the cells. Okay, so there, uh, uh, yeah, the brain sides, uh, that I don't know. So those are data that I obtained uh, from uh databases online so what i tried to do when i chose which data to include in the analysis i tried to keep the same so for instance mice they were all from the same uh, uh, phenotype and genotype so they were all the same family they were all sacrificed in the same way the 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 um, uh, fixation process was the same uh, the kind of reconstruction was the same although it was done from different labs so uh, across species, I didn't normalize. That's a good point. I did not try to normalize the value by the actual brain volume. I know there is a dependence there. I know that there is a correlation, at least for some neuronal cells, that they are bigger, in, for instance, in primates and smaller in, in rodents. So this, I didn't look at it. I just put everything together. So there is a lot we can do there. Um, the, my, my interest was mostly try to give upper and lower bound to what size the soma has, what size the fibers have, what is the typical microglia domain, and so on. Uh, but obviously, yes, that's that's a, it opens up a lot of possible questions. So the idea there, uh, we are preparing the manuscript. The idea is to release all the data and the code out there. So there, everybody, if you want to explore anything more, you can just download the file already processed and dig deeper into it. It's just taking too much, too long time. It was 2021, it's still uh, a, a little bit long, <laughs> but one day you will have that. 
Well, that's what all the my supervisors uh, say is you estimate the time for a specific thing you want to do in research and then you take it by three and that's your actual time. <laughs> yes, like you that. Uh, take the double, but three times. <laughs> but uh, cool. Good luck. Uh, super Thanks. interesting. Thank you for answering my question. Thanks. Eduardo has a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for this talk. Very exciting. Um, so my question is about the exchange rate. Uh, you mentioned uh, toward the, at the end of the talk about the estimation of the membrane uh, permeability. And I was, um, if I uh, remember correctly, at the um, the exchange rate through the white matter is fairly stable and uniform, but I, I've spotted some differences in the gray matters. And I was wondering if that is connected to some um, the structural features of different areas in gray matter, or if is if is it due to uh, problems with the seeding out uh, to, due to the fact that the gray matter is more complicated geometry than the white matter. If you can. Yeah, this is yeah, this is a great uh, this is a very important uh, uh, clarification. So that the, the short answer is we don't know yet. So we 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 believe is mostly is probably due to different level of partial voluming with CSF, because as you said, you know, you have different, uh, so the resolution is not ideal. We had a two by two by two millimeter resolution. So you can imagine how, if you have a very narrow sul sulcus or gyro, gyro, gyrus, you can have more partial volume there. So there is definitely partial voluming with CSF. There is partial volume with white matter, which carries in more myelin, and so if you have more myelin, it will make your exchange time longer. And in in some sense, the myelin, the average myelination in the in the cortex will drive that change in exchange time. If you have more myelination in one area than another, uh, that then the exchange time would be longer. And then there is the third, uh, the third point, which I very briefly commented at the end. We are measuring an exchange between compartments. We don't know if this exchange is intraneurite and extraneurite only. As an example, at this ISMRAM, we will demonstrate that if you have dendritic spines and you have water going in and out of dendritic spines, they mirror exactly the same process, which we call diffusion mediated exchange. And so you can imagine that that contrast it's not only myelination, but it's convoluted between myelination and dendritic spine density, for example. And so if you have more spines, you will have faster exchange because it's the probability to enter and out, to go in and out of spine is, 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 is um, higher than if you have less spines. So to some extent, this is a very active and interesting field of research. We just managed to get uh, human data a month ago. Uh, we will investigate uh, all these options. OK, thank you very much. There's one more question that was sent to us on YouTube by Robert Turner. So the Jesperson's model assumed permeable neuroid membranes motivated by the need for neuroids to carry action potentials without loss. So how can you explain the observed permeability? Oh yeah, yeah. So to some extent, it uh, it uh, it will. Uh, my my previous answer to Eduardo is to some extent answering Robert, uh, Bob as well. So I think. Uh, um, so the the f first of all, uh, uh, we we think that not all uh, the the volume fraction of um, myelinated neurites in the cortex is smaller than the volume fraction of unmyelinated neurites in the cortex. And so you have to imagine that in your model, you have these myelinated and myelinated uh, populations. And if you have 70% uh, unmyelinated and 30% myelinated, those 70% will drive the observed exchange time uh, uh, that we measure. But as I said, the exchange time is not only that we measure cannot directly ascribed to membrane permeability only. There could be other microstructural features that can mimic the same, the same phenomenon and can explain why we measure that exchange. Um, 
I think the, as a bottom line is just if you acquire data in uh, gray matter in the cortex and you change your diffusion time, if you don't account for potential exchange between your model compartment, then you get uh, uh, some bias there. That's what we established. What is the nature, the exact nature of this exchange is a very interesting question. We, we, we are just starting now exploring. So it's a really good comment, Bob, and uh, yeah, we need to, to dig more into that. Thanks. Sounds like there's a lot of exciting work coming uh, yeah, yeah. from your lab and in your future. <laughs> it's, good, <laughs> it's, good. It. it's good for our career and uh, contracts. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep it going. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any raised hand at the moment, so I would use the opportunity to thank you for your talk, for joining us today. And we look forward to all the exciting work that you just snapshotted for us that is coming <laughs> in the near future. Um, thank you for being here. And thanks for all of you for joining us. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And very nice to meet you, all of you. Thank you. Have a good Easter break.